songs tonight, even though it's Wednesday when we've been usually doing Tehillim songs, because the holidays are coming, we want to make sure we catch up with all the parshiot of the Torah. So we're going to cover some of these parshiot on Wednesdays as well, just for the next few weeks. And maybe in between I'll give a special lecture as well. So for Tehillim, we'll just wait till after the holidays. So tonight will be Parashat Kitavo. Parashat Kitavo is read towards the end of the year. Right? We're now in the month of the Lut, the Jewish month of the Lut, towards the end of the year. Yom Adin is coming, Rosh Hashanah, which is not only the beginning of a new year, but it's also the day of judgment. This is a serious time. Jews are immersed in prayer, in repentance, hopefully, but also in self-examination. Self-examination is a very important idea that if people would do more of that, life would look very, very differently. We just live our life, take things for granted, and don't stop to think about what needs to be fixed. You know, in one's home there are things that need to be repaired from time to time. But what about in ourselves? Don't we need to repair certain things? So the month of Elul helps us stop on our tracks and hopefully do the right thing, examine ourselves so that we can make a new commitment for next year to do things a little bit differently. So, Pashat Kitavo in itself contains a lot of important lessons that are designed to wake us up, wake us up from our slumber. Look back to how the year went by and try to see piecemeal, one day at a time, what there is that we can change, that we can improve. I say piecemeal because there's so much that we can handle at any given time. We can see one year at a time, perhaps. Can we look back at our entire life? Sometimes that is also necessary. Look back at the past 20 years, look back at the past 30 years. A little bit more difficult to do, but sometimes it would be a good idea. But in Parshat Kitavo, we see that Kadosh Baruch Hu sends us signals from time to time because we're not doing what we should be doing. And if we're not reminded somehow, we will continue perhaps to do the wrong things for the rest of our life. So there's de definitely a need to take one day at a time perhaps and analyze what it is exactly that is wrong that needs to be corrected. In Parshat Kitavo, we see in some ways a continuation of Parshat Re'e. If you recall, Parshat Re'e, there was an emphasis on blessing and curse. And in this parasha, we actually see in detail what that blessing could be and what, God forbid, the curse could be. Not everybody understands what a blessing is and what a curse is. And that is why when they see certain things happening to them, they don't really know how to interpret it. They're lost. It reminds me of a question that they used to ask a Hatan, a newlywed person just got married, and after a certain amount of time went by, they would approach him and they would ask him, Matza or Motze? There are two verses that describe a wife. One is a verse that describes the blessing that one can have from a wife, and one is God forbid the curse. Matza, Isha, Matza Tov. The words are similar, Matza, Motze, it means to find. And they would ask him, which verse applies to you? You're newly married, you've had a little bit of time to, to see for yourself if you're fortunate or not. Is it matzah, matzah isha, matzah tov? One has found a woman, one has found good, blessing, or is it motzeni mar mi isha? I find something more bitter than death, and that could be a woman. So you have two extremes, a blessing and something that's very, very bitter, something which is almost unbearable. So here we have a description of two opposites that sometimes we don't even realize, but that is our life, what our life could be about. You know, it was in life, you could also have either or. Which one is it? Just that sometimes people don't know how to differentiate. They think they're blessed, but they're not really blessed. They may think that there's a curse, but it's not really a curse, but a blessing in disguise. So sometimes people have a hard time defining what is a blessing and what is a curse. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. 
In Parshat Kitavo, one of the main ideas is that we start to think and make a cheshbon ha-nefesh. Cheshbon ha-nefesh is that self-examination that I, that I mentioned, that is not a necessity for people to do. And if they don't to do it, there will be some reminder, some reminder from above in all kinds of ways, that they begin to think a little bit of what, of what's going on in their life. Because obviously, something is not right, otherwise we don't need reminders. If we're doing everything right, we don't need a reminder, but if something is obviously wrong, we're going to be sent a message. Look at, for example, the signs that you may have seen at the homes of certain people that are for sale. You might see some of them saying pride of ownership. You recall? What does pride of ownership mean? That the person is proud of his home, he's taking care of it. He's realized that this is an important invest investment, not just for him to live comfortably, but in the future if he wants to resell it. So pride of ownership means that he's taking care of the home. You're buying something that is spotless, that is clean, that doesn't need major remodeling or repair. You may enter another home and see the exact opposite. A home that there's no pride whatsoever. A home that has been ignored not taken care of and is in very much disrepair, it needs a lot of work. There's no pride whatsoever in that home. And that is true not just about the home, but about people themselves. There are people that don't take care of themselves, not just health-wise, but character-wise. They just go on with, with their nature, their entire life, without thinking about perhaps I need to change a certain characteristic, a certain weakness, a certain flaw. You are able to see both types of people in the same way that you're able to see both types of homes. So to look back at our life, to look back at the year that went by is relatively easy. We can see what happened. Has anything changed for the better or for the worse? But to look into the future is a lot more difficult, right? To look back may be a little bit easier than to look forward. How am I supposed to know what lies ahead? So there is a famous saying, En chacham kibala nisayon. There is no greater chacham, intelligent person, than one who has experience. What that means is that if you were to speak to someone who is experienced, then you would perhaps have more foresight. You would be able to know things better in advance. Because otherwise, how are you supposed to know what the future is all about, what lies ahead? So it always pays to consult with those who are experienced. Take it from me, an experienced individual would say, don't do this, watch out. I've gone through this. I've been around long enough to tell you that this is no good. It's not right. It's not healthy. So in speaking to someone who's experienced, it definitely is helpful. Another possibility is to look into the Torah. When a Jew studies Torah, he receives direction, he has more clarity, and hopefully he will do things right. What will you find in the Torah? If you consult with the Torah, one of the things that becomes obvious is that life is purposeful. There is a tachlit. We all have a mission. We're all here for a reason. We're not just here to have fun, born, eat, sleep, and die. No, life is purposeful, life has meaning. And that's one of the things that the Torah teaches us, a very important lesson. However, in reality, in practice, there's a lot of people out there that don't live their life like this. Could you imagine somebody going up a bus, sitting down, and you ask them, sir, where are you going? I don't know. Then why did you get on the bus? Believe it or not, there are people that that's the way they live their lives. If you ask them why you're here for, what is life for you, what does it mean to you, they don't really have a clear answer. Life is purposeful. It's like getting on a bus headed towards a certain destination where people don't know what that destination is. They don't even know that there is a destination. Therefore, <coughs> Kohelet, Solomon, wrote a very important book with this in mind. Kohelet, which I have a whole series on Ecclesiastes. He discusses life in various ways. He describes the pitfalls that life has. But what's interesting is how he begins the book and how he ends the book. 
He begins with saying that life is all vain, full of vanities. Wow. When the rabbis first saw that verse, they thought maybe we should put away this book. He's saying that everything is just vain, a waste of time. Until they read the end. And what does he say at the end? That the bottom line is, says the bottom line is, observe God's commandments. Because what God expects of us, the most important thing is that we fear Him. That's what man is all about. That's where it matters. That's where it matters whether he made the right choice or the wrong choice in observing the mitzvot, in being God-fearing or not. How did he behave? Okay, if that's the bottom line and that's what really matters, then why did he begin with, I call heaven above him, everything is made. He should have said, wait a minute, you're about to begin your life seriously, you're a young man, you know, this is what's really important. Observe God's commandments, be God-fearing, be a good gentleman, be honest and so forth. He didn't begin talking about that. He begins how everything is vanities. You know, Solomon had everything. He was very wealthy. He was very, very wise. So he did know a lot. And even though he lived only 52 years, he saw enough in his life to reach that conclusion. It's all vain. Life is full of vanities. Be careful, don't waste your precious time on all these vanities. Why not begin with talking about the more serious things? And the answer is very simple. If had he begun talking about mitzvot, nobody would listen. Nobody would pay attention. Nobody is excited to hear a speech about observance of commandments, about spirituality. It's not fun. People want to hear about vanities. People want to hear about rich, about how people succeeded in life. What do I need to do to succeed in life, to have a beautiful home? These kind of things appeal to people. So he begins right away to tell us all those things that are appealing to you, you should know. It's silly. It's worthless. Don't waste your time and energy. I call the heaven of it's all a bunch of vanities. There was a rabbi years ago, I think about a hundred years ago, that moved from Eastern Europe to Israel. He moved with his entire community. He was very idealistic. And he built a place called Kfar Hasidim, which is known in the north of Israel. It began as a little village, and later on it grew. And his dream was, of course, to get Jews to move to Israel, to establish themselves there, to develop the land. And he had many struggles. It wasn't easy to carry out such a plan for a variety of reasons. At some point, even though it started moving, it was so slow that he pretty much gave up. And he, on his own, moved to California. He actually came here. And his followers, for the most part, either stayed there or moved back to Eastern Europe. When he came to California, his way of life was no longer as religious as it was when he was in Israel. He became more modern. He went to college, educated himself. And this is a rabbi, remember, whose perspective of life was very much into religion. And here he's moving away from that and beginning a life of pursuit of money, real estate. This is California, after all. And that's what he got himself into, and he succeeded. He made a lot of money, a lot of property. But at some point, he stopped. He thought to himself, wait a minute, wait a minute. What exactly am I doing here? Amassing all this fortune, buying more real estate. I'm not going to be taking this with me. Remember, he's getting older. He did a good thing. He stopped to think. Yes, I succeeded. But what is this for? How is this going to help me? He does believe in an afterlife. So he began to really think deeply about the situation and he went back to Israel. He went back and joined his community and again went back to his old lifestyle of complete immersion in the study of Torah and the observance of the Mitzvot. He caught himself at the last possible minute that all of this is heavy lavalim, all this fortune that he amassed. Even though it can be useful, we're not saying that this is totally worthless, we're not discounting it. Obviously a person that has all this fortune 
can do a lot of good with it, but to, to be careful not to overemphasize it. This is not the econ, this is not what life is all about. What happens in life is that people get carried away. It's very difficult to make it, have a lot of real estate, and then be in control in realizing this is fine, nice, but this is not the most important thing for me in life. Not everybody knows where to draw the line. So, in these days, the days of Elul, this is what we're supposed to do, what this rabbi did. What did we manage during this past year? What did we accomplish? What is there yet to accomplish? It's a time to reflect. The reason why most people don't reflect is because, as we call it in Hebrew, they live in Chaim Beseret. It means they live in the movie, they live in the fantasy. What do I mean by a fantasy? People would prefer to escape the reality, even though they realize that life is full of pitfall, pitfalls and problems, they would rather avoid thinking about it. They would rather run away from what the reality really is. Instead, they'd like to immerse themselves in whatever gives them immediate pleasure. If something gives them pleasure, if something enables them to escape the reality of troubles that lie ahead, issues that are difficult to deal with, they'd rather escape that and focus more on what brings them pleasure. The best example is a credit card. The culture of the credit card, I call it. What's that? Buy it. Enjoy it. You pay later. You know, you, <laughs> you're going to worry about it later when you get the bill. Don't think about it right now. You owe it to yourself. You owe you. They tell you you owe it to yourself on vacation. Somebody called me up once. You owe it to yourself to, to travel to Hawaii, hotels. I, I asked him, how do you know that I owe it to myself? <laughs> Where did you get that from? Maybe I just came back from a vacation. Maybe I just was somewhere else. But that is what they're trying to sell. You owe it to yourself. Enjoy life. They say you only live once. All kinds of things. So this is the immediate pleasure and not worry about that this is going to be costly in the end. It's going to be painful in the end. No, why focus on that when I can focus instead on that which gives me pleasure? The problem is that this pleasure is not a real pleasure. It doesn't really bring real happiness to the person. And even if the person is happy, it's just momentarily. Eventually it fades. This is a simcha of heaven, I call it. A simcha, a happiness that is vain, that is not substantial whatsoever. So why are people nonetheless so interested in this? Why does it drive them crazy? Why are they willing to do anything so that they can enjoy something immediately? I was thinking a little bit about this. And think about a movie. There's different kinds of movies. There is a movie that is very funny, comedy we call it. There is documentaries, there is sports, there is war, there's drama, right? all kinds of movies. And what happens with those movies that are full of battle, war, drama, there's always a good side and a bad side. At least that's what I recall. <laughs> And usually, the one watching it wants the one of the two to win. And that's what's going to happen. And he, it makes him happy when he sees the outcome, hopefully, the way he wanted it to be. What apparently is going on subconsciously is that there is a battle, an internal battle in the person himself, too. And that's being reflected on the outside of what he is enjoying. Internally, there's a battle between the good forces and the bad forces. And a person does that, doesn't want, want to win. He's confused, he's not completely happy, there's a continuous battle here going on between the desires or the interests of the soul and the physical body. He doesn't really know that. He doesn't know who those players are. He just knows that internally that there's this battle. And what he also does not realize is that the bad guys hopefully will not be the winners because that is not good if the bad forces win this battle. What he does not realize also that is if you somehow help the good guys win the battle, that's what's going to make you happy. So happiness is something that is not reachable so easily by the average individual because he doesn't know what will bring true happiness. 
he can't identify the good guys from the bad guys. A lot of people think that anything that brings them pleasure is a good guy. Sir, do you know that this may be a bad guy? All those calories in your system, it's good, it's tasty, but you know it's detrimental. So there's a lot of confusion going on internally. So in the same way that people have preferences and enjoy seeing certain things in a movie, I think that that somewhat reflects what's going on internally as well. There's something that wants them to win. You know, they want to win. They want to feel good about themselves or about something. And that is reflected in this continuous internal battle that is taking place inside of them. You also see this idea of whatever brings one pleasure playing out in the news. The news are sometimes fake news, as you've heard these days, because what is their goal? Their goal is to disseminate that which interests them, that which people want to hear. It's not necessarily good. If you're going to be disseminating information that is negative, what are people going to think? Do you know that the news has tremendous influence, tremendous power over the way people think, the way they act? This is a powerful tool. Don't you realize that if you misuse it in a negative way just because it serves you, you may be causing tremendous harm. They don't think about that. This is what brings them pleasure, money, and this is what will maybe make people happy. Oh, we have something to talk about. Did you hear the latest? This gossip. But gossip is no good. But people don't really think about that. So you have this same problem with professionals. These are adults, but they're playing like little children. This is what gives them pleasure. This is what makes them money. This is what is the headlines. This is what sells. But so what? Is that what really matters? That which sells or that which is positive? That which will help people build a better life? Don't you see what's going on in the world? You're contributing firewood to the fire. There's a, lot of, there's a big fire out there. A lot of trouble, and you're contributing to this fire by spreading all these lies and all this negative news. Be careful. Be a responsible human being. No, that's not what interests them. That's not what they're focused. So, in life, after years go by, people will come to some conclusion. And one of those conclusions may be that they're not happy. <laughs> Even though they have money, they have a big home in Malibu, Right. So what's missing? They're not happy. Oh, all of a sudden they realize that what they thought brings them happiness is not real. It's fake. It's vain. So what is missing exactly? Briefly, you will, you will see that a lot of people have what's called in Hebrew pizur adat. Pizur adat means that the person is scattered. He is absent-minded. He's not focused. He doesn't know what he wants. So that's called pisura dat. He's not calm. And as a result of not being calm, not having that tranquility that we've spoken about, his mind is not settled. And as a result of all kinds of issues that he may have in his personal life, he's not happy. All of this is called pisura dat. The mind is scattered. The mind is not focused. What's the opposite of pisura dat? In Hebrew, Yeshuv Hadat. Yeshuv Hadat means that the mind is calm. In Arabic, Rahtin Bal, peace of mind. And in Farsi, we said it was Aram Eshechater. Yeah. Same idea, tranquility, peace of mind. Something which is lacking in a lot of people. Peace of mind, wow. It's a beautiful thing to have. It's a true blessing. Do you need millions of dollars to have peace of mind? No. You can have a few dollars and still have peace of mind. So the big question right now is, how do I get this peace of mind, this tranquility? Because I'm told that this is what will make me happy. Judaism teaches it's very simple. Even though it's not easy, it's simple. There's a big difference between something being easy and something being simple. Easy, a lot of people's nature, by nature, is 
somber, serious, quiet, and reserved. If you look at my series on astrology, you'll have a better understanding of what I mean. By nature, some people are very, very serious, so happiness does not come easy to them. They need to work on it. They need to smile more often. They need to be around positive people. They need to listen to some good music, perhaps. Something to uplift their spirits, to make them happy. But this is still not real happiness. It's some, somewhat artificial, but it's, it's better than nothing. You don't want to look at a person who's always sad, serious looking, or, or worse, depressed. But this is still not real happiness. You have some people that by nature are very jolly and optimistic. Their disposition is happier. It doesn't mean that they will be happy in life, but at least they have it in their nature. People can notice it. They're always smiling, or at least most of the time. It's beautiful. It's really, really nice. So the people who don't have it by nature have to work on it. The rabbis tell us that simcha, happiness, is a very important midah, and we'll talk about it now. It's not easy to acquire if you don't have it by nature, but it's very, very important. So we need to cultivate it, yes. But those that do have it by nature doesn't mean that they're going to be content with themselves about everything in life. So I'm using now the word contentment, which is really more of what I'm talking about. So the question is, how do we acquire that contentment or that happiness that the Torah wants us to have? So the simple way, not the easy way, but the simple way is to focus on life's purpose. I need to get to that destination. Please, don't distract me. <laughs> I need to get there safely, sound and safe. That's something that a lot of people don't do enough. What is the taqlid? We started off saying that some people think that there is no taqlid. Life has no purpose. We're here by accident. There was a big bang once and somehow we just arrived here. Well, you can understand why some of these people who think like that commit suicide when they're not happy. What's the purpose? There's no purpose, right? They say. So if I'm suffering, who needs it? Life has purpose. And it's very important, it will make a big difference to one's life, how he conducts himself, what he does with his time, if he understands that the life is purposeful. So therefore Judaism teaches, focus on the tachlit, on what that purpose is. And once you focus on the tachlit, you will hopefully ask yourself from time to time, what is it that I still need to accomplish? What have I not accomplished as yet? What is important in life and what is a priority? All of this is necessary because otherwise we may be confused. Some things are really not priorities, but people spend a lot of time and their energy on, on them. If you recall, there is a very big enemy out there, an enemy to this cause that we're talking about, focusing on the taqlid, that life is purposeful, meaningful, do things right, behave yourself, it makes a big difference. Who's the enemy who doesn't believe in all of that? Amalek. A lot of people don't understand who is this Amalek, what does he want, why is this, does the Torah call him the worst enemy of all? So I have a whole lecture on that. Why did the Torah command us to eradicate Amalek? A lot of people don't like that lecture because it seems to be that, we're, that we need to annihilate certain people. It's not about that, it's not about human beings being annihilated, it's about this philosophy that is so dangerous to us that we have to be aware of. Because that philosophy is completely opposite, completely contrary to Judaism, the exact opposite. And that is why it poses a big danger to the Jew. It's also a danger to the world because what they emphasize is materialism. <clears throat> what Judaism emphasizes is spirituality. What they say, what they claim is life has no purpose. Enjoy life. Serve God. What's this God all about? There's no such thing, they say. You only live once. So therefore, there's no service of God. There's only olam in this physical world. There's only materialism, nothing else. So for the Jew, this is a big danger, this philosophy. One way that I thought of describing this is imagine a plant, a beautiful plant. It's so beautiful, you want it to last. You have to put it in water, right? To preserve it, to preserve its freshness. Imagine you don't give it any water, you deprive it. It's going to die, it's going to dry up. 
A Jew cannot be without the Torah. The Torah is the water. He will dry up. If he doesn't have that simcha, that happiness, that what he's doing is the right thing, because he lacks clarity of what is the purpose of life, eventually those mitzvot that he was instructed as a child will become a burden for him. I don't know why my dad believes in this. This appears to be primitive. Those guys had it all wrong. We're an advanced people today. We have technology. We've reached Mars. And, you know, people begin to think very, very differently than what our forefathers taught us. To them, there was a lot more clarity as to what they're here for, what they need to do. Today, there's a lot of distraction. It doesn't mean that in the past there was no distraction. There was always different kinds of distraction. Once upon a time, philosophy was very, very powerful. And that got people to think in different ways. All of a sudden, you have the emergence of Islam and Christianity, other cults and religions that can also be distracting. Who is the one that te is teaching the truth over here? People can become confused. But obviously, if you don't have purpose, a sense of purpose of what, this, what life is all about, it becomes even more difficult. If you understand that life is meaningful, it pays to be good and honest and do the right things, then you will find that a lot of religions have much in common. Then why point to the differences? Who cares about the differences? We have a lot in common. And that's also in a separate lecture about religions of the world. Not everybody's focusing on what we have in common. Imagine if they did, there would be no conflicts. We're not talking about who's better. Who cares about who's better? That's not the point here. We have a lot of things in common. Let's emphasize those things that we have in common because they will serve us well. So a Jew who is detached or cooled off from his Judaism by forces of Amalek is in imminent danger of losing his identity, not realizing what's so important and so special about being Jewish. There's other nations in the world. They seem to be doing fine. So therefore, in this week's parasha, we have a beautiful, a very special mitzvah that helps us focus on the taklit. And a lot of people, when they read the parasha, would not even think of it that way. That's the mitzvah of Bikurim, bringing the first fruits to the Bet Amidash, to the temple, giving it to the Kohen. Right? You pick the first fruit, and you're so happy about it, the time when the harvest has come, take the first fruit to Yerushalayim. Very interesting mitzvah. Bikurim is like Bechor, the firstborn. Something special about the first. Okay, before you enjoy the rest, bring some of it to the Bet Amidash. There was a whole ceremony involved there. It's not just bringing the fruit. The deeper idea behind what's going on in this mitzvah is as follows. This man was able to see from seed to fruit. He planted it. Wait a minute. The seed eventually became a tree, eventually this tree bore fruit. Oh, there's a tachlit here, there's a purpose. Otherwise, why are you planting the seed to begin with? Because you want to see the fruit. And by the way, the fruit is not the ultimate tachlit, that's not the purpose. There's something else beyond that. And that is, this fruit you're going to take to the Bet HaMikdash, to the temple. And you're going to say some beautiful words there. Words of thanks to the Almighty for having given you this blessing. So all of this is purposeful. The mitzvah of Bikurim, or the first fruit, teaches the Jew to realize everything has a purpose. And here, I'm bringing this to the Bet HaMikdash, and I'm going to express my thanks to Hashem. And along with giving thanks to Hashem, there's additional prayers that he says. The whole history over the Jewish people is also mentioned at the time how we started off where we did and where we ended up in Israel. There's a whole speech that he gives. But besides this speech, if you read Parashat Kitavo, you will notice that there's another small speech that is also given at a different time when one removes all the tithing that he had not removed yet from his home and given it to those who, to whom it belongs. He also gives a speech at that point that I've done everything that I was told as I was instructed. Asiti kefisha tzivitani, as the words read. I have done as you've instructed me. And what does that mean? If you look at the commentary of Rashi, Rashi says that I've done as you instructed me means that I was happy and that I made others happy. Samahti besimahti. Oh, this is a big revelation. In 
In these mitzvot, we find that there's an emphasis not only in being happy yourself for everything Hashem has given you, for which you are thankful and grateful. No, make sure that you've, what you've also done is make others happy. So true happiness lies in this. True happiness lies in making others happy, not just making yourself happy. You can never be completely happy if you've not made others happy. You know what it is to make somebody happy and to see that smile on his face? It's, it's a very special feeling. So, samachti besimachti. There's an emphasis, of course, on being happy with what Hashem has given you, but in order for that happiness to be complete, make sure that you make others happy, especially those who are destitute, those that don't have all that blessing that you have. So, making others happy and doing the will of Hashem, this is what will bring happiness to us. What else is he saying? He's also saying that I've done everything according to the right order. There's a certain order in which the tithe has to be given, the Tuma, the Maaser, and so forth. It's important to do it in that order. What does that teach us? Priorities. Certain things come first, certain things come second. And one of the reasons people's life is messed up is exactly because of this. They're all unhappy. They don't know why they're unhappy, but many times it could be because their priorities are messed up. So let me give you just one example, because there are many. One example of where people's priorities are not necessarily right. Imagine somebody was offered a very, very good job that makes a lot of money. But because of the distance, or because of the hours, or both, he will rarely see his family and his children. They will be asleep by the time he comes home. He'll be leaving early before they wake up. And if he's Jewish, he will not have a chance to spend time at the synagogue with everybody else praying together, which has tremendous power, by the way, to pray with a minyan, with a group, not to pray by yourself. Is it worth it for him to take that job? Because it's promising as far as the salary is. He can get another job that is not as, doesn't give him as big as a salary, but at least he'll see his children more often. At least he'll be able to pray together with others. What do you think he should do? Which one should he choose? A lot of people think that the money is the most important thing in their life. That's priority number one, but it's not true. It's very hard to convince them if they think that this is the only world there is. If life is all about pleasure, how are you going to convince them that this is silly? Are you going to take all that cash with you to the grave? What are you going to do with all that money? You can make some money closer to home, see the family, pray with everybody else, and not rush, not be stuck in traffic. Come on, money isn't everything, but some people think it is. So this is just a quick example that unfortunately is common, <coughs> that a lot of people mistake their priorities, they mess them up, and they end up not being happy. They end up perhaps even dying early because of all that stress of driving, getting there, and who knows what, all, what other problems they may have at that job. Somebody who's religious, I can easily convince him, hopefully, do you know that if you don't pray in a minyan, in a group, you know how many times you're going to miss out in answering amen? Do you know that answering all those amenim are worth more than all the money you could ever make in your life? Who told you that, he says. He thinks about dollar bills. To him, that is a big treasure. That is something that he can point to and say, you see, I've made it in life. He doesn't see the reward for answering one amen because that reward is not necessarily given here, it's given upstairs. So it's hard to convince people who don't understand. That's why if one learns Torah and he sees example after example of people who have testified to that because either they appeared in a dream or the rabbis have said so that we trust, otherwise they won't know, but that is the fact. The fact is that answering all these amenim are much more rewarding in many ways than making more money. So why would you give that up? Which one should be priority number one? Obviously not everybody has that chance to spend every day, every morning, every afternoon in a synagogue. But at least once, at least twice a week. At least something better than nothing. But nothing at all? Why? Just for the money? How could you compare? So now we can understand somewhat the biggest enemy of happiness. 
I spoke earlier about the enemy of the Jewish people, but what's the biggest enemy of happiness that's depriving people of that happiness? Materialism. Not just simple materialism, but being obsessed with it. I'm not talking about people who want to have nice furniture, a nice home, a beautiful garden, completely in the right to do that. The rabbis even talk about how good it is to have these things because they brighten your life, as they say. They do bring a certain sense of tranquility. Imagine if you have a nice home, furnishing, as long as you can afford it. Yes, but don't exaggerate it. Don't be obsessed with it. Don't make that the ikar. That's not the most important thing. So that's where the problems begin, when people overemphasize materialism. So the overemphasis of materialism is the enemy of happiness. Why is it the enemy of happiness? Because true happiness is not in the physical body. It's in the neshama. That's where it all begins to make more sense now. We talked about the people who want to have immediate pleasure. Pleasure. Immediate pleasure. What's that? The physical body. Let it feel good. Let it enjoy itself. They don't realize. No, but that's short-lived. It won't last. You know where it's going to really make you happy? Is if your neshama, if your soul is happy. You want to make the soul happy. Spiritually. You want to feel good about your accomplishments. That's also spiritual. Not the money. Accomplishments, I'm not talking about the physical money. Accomplishments, I've helped a lot of people this year. I was able to make someone feel good. I visited the sick. These kind of accomplishments. These will bring you happiness because these relate to the soul. It's the soul that's going to be happy, not the physical body. So therefore, if you're emphasizing the physical body, that's going to be an enemy in the end of the happiness because you're starving the soul. The soul needs to be nourished as well. So because people overemphasize materialism, not everybody is able to achieve true happiness in life. So, if you look at the Torah, you will now understand why the Torah is so adamant, so strong about being happy in the service of Hashem. Happiness is something very important in the service, not just as a characteristic, be a happy person, be content, in the service of Hashem. Because if one observes the mitzvot without happiness, just as a ritual, just as something that is routine, without really being excited about it, he eventually risks completely cooling off from it and abandoning it altogether. Hashem is saying, be careful with this. I don't like that. It means you don't want to have a relationship with me. Think about it this way. Imagine somebody remembered that it's his wife's birthday. That's very nice. He remembered it. But he doesn't want to write her a card. He's lazy, or he's just not in the mood, and he buys a card that has a greeting, Happy Birthday. Well, I think everybody would say, better than nothing, better than nothing. Now, imagine that this husband made his wife upset. He made his wife upset many, many times during the year. Don't you think that if he wrote a letter asking forgiveness, saying how beautiful she is, how he appreciates everything she is. This will make a big difference than just a plain birthday card. In Hebrew, this, this is called Matzit Yedei Chova, just to get by. Here, I want to get by, I don't want her to get angry at me. Another reason for her to get upset is that I forgot her birthday. So I'm going to go to some store that sells cards and get her something. Very nice. Again, it's better than nothing. But this is not what will make her happy. If you really are interested in a solid relationship, you have to demonstrate it, you have to prove it. This is not enough. Words, handwritten, that you took the time to do it, that you're so happy to do it, you went out of your way to buy her a cake, even though it's a cake. A lot of people will tell you when you buy them the gift, thank you for thinking of me, it's not the gift, it's the thought. Have you heard that? It's not the gift, they don't need it. Especially if they're on a diet, who wants to eat the cake? <laughs> it's the thought. The person went out of their way. Hashem says, I want to see that you're happy with me. I want to see that you're excited to do the mitzvot. Otherwise, I'm not going to be very happy with you either. So the Torah puts an emphasis on simcha, reminding us of the danger of not being happy about observance of the mitzvot. It's not just about life right now. It's about the connection with Hashem. Happiness, therefore, strengthens that connection with Hashem. That is why it's such an important midah. 
it strengthens our connection with him and it strengthens the bond that we need to have with the mitzvot. So perhaps we can summarize that the, the biggest beracha of all the biggest blessing that one can ever have is if he has happiness. <laughs> and the biggest curse kalala is if he has no happiness. If we can somewhat summarize it this way and simplify it, this is what it really amounts to. However, even though we were saying all along that the kelanot that come down from above, the curses, are intended to awaken us, in the end Hashem doesn't want to bring us a kelalai curse because He just wants to punish us. The kelalai is designed to awaken us. If we don't awaken by ourselves, He has to do it. So in the end we must realize that every kelala is a blessing in disguise. What's the blessing here? The blessing is hopefully this is what's going to get you to think. And if it got you to change your ways in life, then it was for your good. You would agree, right? We just don't always react that way. We complain, we feel bad about it. But sir, if you understand that God exists, and that life is purposeful, and He's watching over us, then realize that that's part of your emunah too. That everything that happens, even if it's hard for you to deal with, it's a challenge, it's a test, it's intended to awaken you, to realize this is perhaps something that He wants from you. I'm going to share with you a story that happened in Israel not too long ago, maybe 10, 15 years ago. There was a family in Yerushalayim, very religious family, who always had in their home as a guest this individual who was homeless. A man who has no family, a man who had no money, and was always in need, not just of a place to eat, but of attention too, of the warmth of a family. And they had him over, just about every Shabbat, I believe, for many, many years. It's a big mitzvah. This family eventually moved to another apartment in some other neighborhood in Jerusalem. And obviously, when they moved, they lost touch with that individual. He no longer came. So they moved into a brand new apartment, and something strange begins to happen in a brand new apartment. It's full of scorpions. Dangerous stuff. Now, imagine there were cockroaches. You wouldn't like it either, but scorpions? So what did they do? What would you do? Fumigation. It's not one. Many scorpions. So they fumigated. Next week, again, full of scorpions. Wow. They've never seen this before. Even the guy with fumigated says, it never happened to me. I don't know where they're coming from. This went on for a few weeks. Every time they got rid of them, more scorpions came. And they said, wait a minute. Let's think about this. This must be from above, from Shabbat. Why is this happening to us? And Baruch Hashem, I think it's very, it's most likely, I mean, that God enlightened them. I mean, otherwise, how did they think of this? God enlightened them. You know what? It could be because of that gentleman. We never let him know that we moved. He doesn't have a new address. We haven't had it. He doesn't have a place to go. Perhaps it's because of that that this is happening. Let's call him up. Let's invite him again. Let's tell him where we live. And sure enough, after they brought him to their new home, the scorpions disappeared. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's related. Otherwise, how do you explain it? But they were enlightened. Somehow, they figured it out. How? They stopped to think about it. They didn't just say, more fumigation, more fumigation. Let's move somewhere else. No, they realize that this is from Shammai. They took action. They took the right action. So what happens in life, since we're talking about all these signs from heaven, is yes, Hashem does send signals. He does send us signs from heaven in all kinds of ways. It could be in a dream. It could be in business. It could be in the house. But you'd be surprised that sometimes even through children, a child by saying something to you, that is unusual, maybe, is telling you something that you should know that you didn't realize on your own. It could come from a child. There was a story with a great rabbi who used to be away from home a lot. I think he was collecting for some important cause or 
involved in some other good deed, mitzvah, but he used to be away for a while. And, you know, children look forward to their daddy coming home. When their dad finally come, came home, they opened the door, and the first thing they asked their father is, Abba, did you bring us anything? What did you bring us? You know, children want to know, what did their dad, who's been away for so long, bring them? What did you bring us, Abba? And as soon as they said that, he began to cry. He said, wow, that's exactly the question they're going to ask us upstairs. What did you bring us? You, we put you down into this world for 75, 78 years. What did you do with your time? What did you bring us? And this is the question they ask of us every year too, when we come to Rosh Hashanah. What did you accomplish this year? What did you bring us? Upstairs they're going to know. Upstairs they want to know. What is it? So it's not just this year. It's the whole life. What have we done with our time, the time that is so precious that they gave us to use in a, in, a, in a positive way. What have we done with it? Have we just squandered it and played around and done nothing constructive with it? What have we brought that really is meaningful in this meaningful life? So I think that this is the most important message of this month as we get close to Rosh Hashanah in realizing that we're preparing ourselves for the Day of Judgment is that let us hope that through our reflection, that we reflect and that we examine ourselves, we make the commitment, that God willing, to bring with us a lot of good things. Amen.